Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us on this very special afternoon, a live stream of music and conversation, reflections of the Arab world, here with two very special guests, Torek Yunus and Rasa Mahmoudian. I'm Tom Clues, Executive Director of Crossing Borders Music and the cellist. We're going to talk to you later, but first we wanted to start with some beautiful music, a la Delona, by, uh, arranged by Dia Sukar, a traditional Levantine melody. Please enjoy this beautiful music. Thank um. Such a beautiful and refreshing melody and tune, which is appropriate. Um, that melody is about sitting and enjoying a refreshing and soothing, calm breeze. Just a beautiful traditional melody from the Levant region. And again, that was arranged by Dia Sukari. He was originally from Aleppo, Syria. And at the age of 13, he went to Paris and studied at the Paris Conservatoire, 
One of his teachers was the composer Olivier Messiaen. And you can really hear, at least I can really hear the French influence as well as those sort of regional melodies um, from the Levant region. I, I think it's beautiful the way he combines those influences uh, and also captures that spirit of it just being very refreshing. Uh, he described his music as neither Arab nor European, but both at the same time. Uh, I'm sad to say he's no longer with us, passed away in 2010, um, but his music is still very much with us. Uh, again, I'm Tom Clues, executive director and cellist of Crossing Borders Music. And uh, with, here, with here with me, here with me is uh, my colleague, uh, violinist and composer and wonderful all around musician, uh, Mr. Rasa Mahmoudian. Hey, Rasa. Hello, uh, I'm so happy to be here and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Rasa. I play the violin with Crossing Borders Music. I uh, extensively teach uh, with uh, an organization called uh, Ravinia. And uh, also I uh, play with uh, different orchestras and some ensembles. Uh, for example, I play with Middle Eastern Ensemble at the University of Chicago. And uh, I hope you uh, enjoy every uh, piece in this program. Thank you so much. Rasa, I was reminded as we were listening uh, of those sections that sound very much like an improvisation and a conversation between the different performers, um, just kind of making things up in conversation with one another. And, and I was reminded of how in rehearsal, you explained how that's sort of a, a way of playing that you're very familiar with, and you were able to sort of help us understand how that worked. Um, Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, uh, growing up I uh, uh, in Iran, I uh, was uh, hearing a lot of melodic um, music, but uh, most of them were poetic. So they're based on poems, and uh, there, there are some liberties that the musicians take uh, while performing them. And uh, uh, the music is mostly by ear, so it's not uh, very uh, rigidly notated. So it, there are lots of it happening that uh, at the moment, however, the musician feels or the it's a reflection of the environment they are in. Um, so they perform every time differently. And in this piece, uh, uh, he was able to document that and uh, ask us to uh, take certain liberties, whatever uh, is appropriate. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, really, uh, some fine composing. Um, and, and again, I really hear that sort of gentle, refreshing breeze. Um, I also wanted to introduce uh, our special guest today, uh, Mr. Torek Yunus. Uh, Torek um, is from Jordan and uh, is in Amman now. It's late there, so thank you for being with us <laughs> late in the evening. Um, Torek uh, won, as I understand, a, a number of awards, uh, that um, some of which allowed him to study uh, in London, where he earned uh, degrees in music composition and uh, advanced degree in, an advanced degree in ethnomusicology from the University of London. Um, at, after his bachelor's at Trinity College, he's now um, a pianist and educator and composer and especially a concert presenter, a concert organizer, you do it all. You, you, I, I hope that you get some sleep. <laughs> Welcome so much, Torek. Well, one has to be when there's so much one, you know, that I'd like to do and would like to be involved in. And uh, Jordan is uh, a very um, beautiful place that has fantastic artists and wonderful musicians, truly talented musicians. And I am very privileged to be uh, living here. I am also Colombian um, by background. So I have a very strange mixture of Middle East, Latin American and European music um, influences. Um, indeed, I did uh, do my uh, degrees in London, all of them. Um, I had a number of awards uh, mentioning the Chevening, uh, the MBI, the Purcell, and a Queen's, uh, Queen Noor Endowment, uh, plus, the, of course, the uh, Abdel Mahsan Qattan Foundation of Four Arts. Um, those were uh, my scholarships, which allowed me to actually continue and finish my degrees and come back to Jordan and hope I'd be able at some point to make uh, a difference 
if if at all um, small, but uh, to try and better the music life in the city and for both audience and I am an educator uh, by nature, so I teach extensively and I uh, uh, I quite enjoy bringing music to the masses. So through concerts or through education or through composition, that's I guess what my role is in life. <laughs> and I've basically and something that we're all doing today at the very best that we can. So we want to shout out to everybody who's with us virtually today watching this live stream. Uh, if you have comments, and especially if you have questions for us, we will get those um, uh, in real time and be able to respond the very best that we can. Um, Tarek, I wanted to ask you, was it common um, when you were able, um, through your achievements, to, to go to London and study uh, in a in a Western music program, was that was that something that people commonly did, uh, uh, sort of your classmates, or was that sort of a new and unique thing to you? Not at all. Uh, in fact, the the first scholarship, the Purcell Anniversary Fund, was created by Her Majesty Queen Noor Al Hussein uh, to support uh, a fledgling number of musicians uh, to pursue further uh, education at international conservatoires. And uh, the first scholarship had three individuals on it, myself, Malak Tahir, and the wonderful Jordanian pianist, Tala Tutunji. And uh, they only sent three because the scholarship, unfortunately, uh, did not continue uh, due to many um, problems uh, in its management. Uh, but anyway, um, we managed to continue. Um, now we do know that there are more people that are seeking uh, education, uh, a Western sort of classical education in, in, in music uh, globally. And uh, there are many names uh, that have, uh, that have sort of, you know, um, we're rising, are, are currently rising stars. Um, uh, but no, at the time when we were, I mean, when we were in, in Jordan, we, we didn't even have access to a lot of material to listen to. I think the first time I listened to The Rite of Spring was in my first year of college. And uh, that was quite an amazing experience to be able to listen to anything that was past the 1900s in, in terms of composition. Um, I uh, was very fortunate to study with uh, people who understood that and um, saw that I had something to offer, um, but uh, allowed me to have a voice and at the same time to you know, to express myself through my background um, in the medium that I have chosen. Um, um, I studied under the wonderful um, British composer, Daryl Runswick, and uh, he has been instrumental in find, helping me find my voice, let's say. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, and it's, it's really neat to hear about your experience encountering um, some sort of pivotal works in the Western classical music tradition. And I hope that this live stream might inspire some people out there to explore, who may not be familiar with uh, the Arab classical music tradition to similarly explore works from that wonderful um, tradition. I, I think it's great to sort of be aware of the larger world out there. So I hope some people might be inspired um, to learn more just as you learn more. Uh, about Western classical uh, music and the Rite of Spring and so forth. Um, our next piece is the Refugees Anthem, the International Refugees Anthem. And uh, this is by Ariane Hu. Um, and it's arranged by our very own Rasa, um, who did a wonderful job with this arrangement. Would you like to tell us about this uh, piece we're about to hear, Rasa? Sure thing. So uh, again, uh, this was composed by Aryan Hu. Um, uh, he, uh, he's a Syrian refugee, but he lives in Beijing right now. Um, this uh, piece was commissioned by a refugee nation in 2016, and it was used at the Olymp Olympics at the same, on the same year. Um, Aryan says about the music that he writes that uh, music is the best language to deliver my message to humanity. Uh, which is to love each other, and uh, this language does not need uh, or require any translation. Um, in the process of, uh, well, because we wanted to perform it, this it was uh, written for a full orchestra. So 
um, when I we, when we wanted to perform it, someone needed to uh, arrange it, and uh, I decided to keep uh, the arrangement to uh, very close to the composition and add uh, the minimum uh, possible to it, um, because again, this is supposed to be an anthem, and usually the anthem has certain uh, characteristics. It's short. It's supposed to be melodic that uh, everyone remembers. So. It was beautifully composed, and uh, I uh, tried so hard to keep it as original as possible. Yeah, thank you, Rasa. One thing that I remember, well, first of all, I want to say, uh, Ariane, uh, thank you so much for your music. And if you're watching, uh, thank you so much for allowing us to perform your work and share your work. Um, and thank you, Rasa, for this wonderful arrangement. One thing that I really enjoyed about uh, Ariane's comments about his own music is that he tried to write this not necessarily in a Syrian style, but in a style that refugees, no matter where they're from, anywhere in the world could relate to. And Ressa, I, I really appreciate how that's something that you took to heart and how you arranged this, that uh, it's not any one particular place, but it's for refugees around the world, no matter where you're from. This is a piece to honor you. So many people from the very beginnings of our organization at Crossing Borders Music have been refugees um, in, a, in our board, uh, composers, performers, and so uh, refugees everywhere. Uh, this piece is dedicated to you. Please enjoy uh, Refugees Anthem by Ariane Hu, uh, arranged by Rasa Mahmurian. Thank you, Rasa, and congratulations. Um, yeah, wonderful to hear that. Um, and again, uh, for refugees uh, everywhere um, who are part of our organization, who have been connected with our organization, who are not connected with our organization, uh, that piece is in honor of you. Thank you. Uh, Rasa, I wanted to ask you a little bit uh, what it was like growing up in Iran and playing and learning the violin and being a musician. Um, well, I, you know, when I, when I was growing up, it, it was the war time. Uh, I, I was born into the war, and then um, 
you know, it was not something that was encouraged or something that was popular at that time, uh, especially it was very handpicked uh, people who could, you know, you, could, you would know that they're playing instruments, especially in Western style, like uh, learning a violin or guitar in a uh, Western uh, traditional. So, uh, but I had this opportunity that my family were kind enough to provide me this uh, access, but uh, what I remember, I I had uh, relatively very good teachers, and uh, they were like I had the instruction that it, uh, a music student needs to improve. And, but uh, at the same time, the access to materials was very difficult. Access to um, even the instruments or uh, high quality instruments was very uh, limited. Um, uh, of course, it was after the revolution. It was during the war, and um, as we went through it, it got a little bit better. Uh, more and more people joined to learn instruments. Uh, you could find friends to play with, uh, especially orchestras or ensembles started opening up. Uh, but it still, it was uh, some sort of challenge. But um, I was fortunate to get good instruction in Western style. And later, I uh, started learning uh, about the music Persian uh, traditional music on my own. Wonderful. Tarek, I saw you nodding uh, somewhat emphatically when Rasa was talking about issues of access. Indeed. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, I mean, I think the first time I, I listened to uh, Stravinsky was at college and it was quite an eye opener. Um, there was a limited amount of, um, I mean, obviously with before the advent of the age of the internet, um, we had very limited amount of music available to us. And uh, mostly um, um, the, uh, uh, the whatever we had was due that to that our teachers either traveled or got access to some sort of uh, music for us to look at. Um, my uh, wonderful teacher that basically um, got me from the age of 15 to the level of which, uh, to which I got a, a scholarship was uh, Rula Nabil. And I remember that she had an extensive library that, but it was a private library. It wasn't, uh, you know, for public access. And we, as her students, had the opportunity to look at music and read scores. And I think I learned very basic orchestration from simply looking at um uh, looking at the scores she had at home. Um, uh, then, of course, the idea that uh, we tended to enjoy whatever was available to us without exploring something fresh and new and completely different. In uh, 1993, I was given an opportunity to go before my bachelor's to the UK um, by a composer, Steve Martland, who invited me to come and spend a month learning minimalist music. And it was quite, it was just a small advert in BBC Music that my uh, teacher had on her table and we sent my piece and I was accepted. So I went to the UK for a month and I spent two wonderful weeks learning about minimalist music and writing um, music in a completely different manner. Um, and uh, I we relished access, but unfortunately it wasn't available to us at all. Um, and it was difficult. And unless we traveled, um, we, would, we didn't have access to that. So yes, I, I definitely understand the whole, the, the, the whole dilemma of, of exposure at the time. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, both of you. Torek, I'm wondering, um, speaking of access, uh, how accessible is um, music composed by Arab composers for Western instruments? Um, is that something that you were aware of growing up? And as a composer now, do you feel what, what sorts of platforms are available? Currently, there are very few. There's, uh, there's, there, there are some efforts around the world, some by very dear friends of mine in Canada called Dozan World. And they're doing a fantastic job at, uh, at trying to document as many Arab composers as possible. Um, the, uh, um, they are... They, there, there are many efforts around the world um, to try and collate um, the uh, the works of Arab composers that is available to them. Again, a lot of these uh, are written in in notation purely for a, a specific ensemble, and that ensemble would have it and 
no one else would. And uh, because of that, so the access, it's, it's, you, you'd have to go into people's private collections to find out what they've got and what they've, uh, what they've accumulated over the years. There's no one particular library or registration or, um, the, I mean, the setup is there, really. I mean, for, for any kind of uh, intellectual property registration in the country and in countries around us. But uh, do do we do we go to to through those hoops and loops in order for us to actually get it done? No, we don't. I mean, we compose something for, like I wrote for you at Crossing Borders, and therefore you know you get to, you you have access to that material. But uh, unless somebody knows I exist um, online and then they contact me directly, I mean it's impossible for you know for me to know uh, who would publish my work. Uh, that's number one. Number two is the fact that. Um, uh, the uh, a lot of the music that is actually written in the Arab world, we have to make a very important distinction that there's a there's a mixture, there's a melange of Western uh, European classical music and Arabic classical music, which is and they are very much intertwined in the region, um, and specifically and spe especially at I mean these days I mean uh, um, the the composers uh, tend to uh, the Arabic classical composers tend to work with uh, uh, Western notation uh, per se, and uh, with that they would be able to uh, um, to, to d disseminate the music more widely. Um, the idea of notating Arabic maqams, uh, which are uh, which have a lot of quarter tones, and all of these are new and fresh uh, uh, things that happened in the past 40, 50 years through scholarship in Egypt and in the Levant and in other parts of the Arab world, uh, like the, the Maghreb. Uh, but um, in terms, so that caused a problem of access in a sense that music in the classical Arabic music in general is very much a an oral tradition you just don't um, it's it's not written then you know teacher to this to student to, to to further students and so it's a tradition that continues on and uh, musicians were troubadours that traveled uh, from place to place and they would perform their music and somebody would copy it but nobody would actually write it down um, and that continued even when they started using western instruments or or the like um, they wouldn't write anything down they would actually just you know perform something uh, together as an ensemble arabic music is very monophonic it's not polyphonic so in a sense if you know the tune and you know how to improvise then voila all the power to you and uh, you're part of the ensemble i i appreciate that just um for anybody who's watching um uh who may not be familiar with those terms monophonic meaning that there's one melody line that sort of everybody shares and, and plays at the same time versus, which is, is the sort of traditional uh, Arab uh, musical approach versus uh, polyphony, meaning that different people are playing different tunes or different parts that fit together. They're separate, but they go together, mm -hmm. um, uh, each one being different, which is more common in a, in a Western classical, European classical um, tradition. Uh, thanks for that, Torah. I, I am reminded you you shared uh, some sort of unique difficulties of of using Western notation, which isn't really ad adequate, frankly, to to capture the subtleties, um, including of uh, some of the music that we'll hear today, where there are notes that you can't really play on a on a European piano. They're sort of in between the cracks of two notes. Um, uh, you know, a black key and a white key. Um, are two separate notes on the piano, but there are notes that are not quite that black key or not quite that white key, and they're sort of in between the cracks, and, and the Western notational system doesn't have a great way of, of capturing those notes. Um, and uh, uh, Torek, I'm also reminded you, you shared um, that Western notation reads from left to right, whereas the Arabic script reads from right to left. And so uh, uh, composers have had all kinds of sort of uh, um, innovative ways of, of responding to those difficulties. I think it's, it's fascinating. Um, and I also wanted to thank you for um, fascinating and, and, and inspiring to see uh, that sort of creativity in response to those challenges. Speaking of, you mentioned the challenge of, of access um, and mentioned Dozan World. And I'm, I'm so thankful to you, Torek, for putting me and Crossing Borders Music in touch with that organization. And we're going to uh, look to see how we can work together um, to you know, be the change that we want to see. 
um, so thank you for that. Um, our next piece is by Tupac Sukar. He was born in 1922 uh, and uh, we're, we're so thankful to be able to um, play this early work of his. Uh, Rasa, you were really drawn to Tufik's music. Uh, what was it about it that, you, that drew you in? Yeah, so when we were uh, kind of preparing for this program, researching it, uh, that, that takes a long time to actually put together a program like this. Um, uh, I came across a, a composer and uh, which the first thing usually you go, you go to YouTube and then you uh, branch out to other databases or places that uh, you know, we can find music and kind of research it. So I, I came across a composer uh, from Lebanon that I never heard before. And as soon as I started playing the music, uh, either it was a string quartet or piano me solo music, I was just uh, stunned by it. It was like, this is beautiful. Like, why do I not know this composer? So, um, it, Sukar, uh, Tufik is using a lot of melodic content of uh, what I know, I, I heard. There were a lot of cross-cultural um, uh, melodies between uh, Iran and uh, in Mid Middle East. We share a lot of things, uh, not only uh, like dolma or other uh, you know, food, uh, but we share melodies as well. And there are lots of them uh, that I grew up listening to. And um, yeah, the way he uses these melodies, these folkloric me melodies and the traditional music in, and integrated into his music, it, it, it is fascinating. So um, again, this was, as Tarek was mentioning, uh, it, it was very um, eye-opening to me that uh, this is a very accomplished composer and I never heard uh, about him before. And it was really hard to even find any music by him in print. Uh, so uh, it took us a long time to find it. And, uh, you know, we were able to perform this wonderful piece. Yeah, uh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I want to give a big thank you. Merci beaucoup to Nena, uh, Tufet's wife, Nena, who, uh, uh, along with their children, helped us to access this score. Um, I think this is the first time that this work is being shared online, as far as I am aware. Uh, an early string quartet in three movements. Uh, the first movement quotes the melody under the olive tree. In the second, the love song, Let's Go to the Valley, Hand in Hand, a beautiful movement uh, based on that love song. And then the third is an original tune by Tufet. And then uh, another traditional uh, melody, The Beautiful. Um, again, we really want to thank Nena for her help uh, in providing this score to us. Um, and uh, we also want to mention that um, Tufik identifies as a Lebanese composer. Uh, Nena explained that this is an appropriate um, term uh, or a Mediterranean composer because of the unique geography and musical influences uh, on Lebanese music, the Mediterranean influences. So please enjoy uh, an early, early, wonderful early string quartet by Tufa Sukar.
All right, so that was the first movement of the string quartet. Let's hear the next two. Okay, so uh, we heard the first movement of Tufek Sukar's uh, string quartet. We'll look forward to hearing the next two movements in a little bit. Uh, I just love uh, the combination of those um, uh, different influences uh, on the music that we hear there. Um, uh, in the meantime, um, Rasa, would you like to tell us about um, uh, would you like to tell us about uh, our next piece by Isa Bulos? Sure thing. So um, the next performance is a solo oud improvisation by Isa Bulos. Isa is a Palestinian American oud player. Uh, he's a composer, he's an ethnomusicologist and educator. Um, in this piece, he performs the 14th and the 3rd Junes. And uh, Issa writes that 14 and 3rd Junes explores the melodic contours uh, of various maramat. Marams uh, are the modes uh, in Arabic traditional music. Uh, and in this uh, piece, he explores um, marams like uh, Rahid al uh, Hijaz, Nahavand, Bayati, Kurdi, Nikriz, Rast, Ajam, and Hijaz Kar. Uh, Although the piece is improvised, it relies on developing pre-composed uh, short melodic ideas uh, and expanding them according to the Maram's tradition and a new traditional approaches and techniques. Um, the underlying components of uh, this uh, piece that keeps the piece together is the meaning. Um, June was the month uh, when Issa's family used to spend more time together. And uh, the central idea behind this piece is that Issa's father had uh, a stroke in 1982, uh, which interrupted such a gatherings. And uh, unfortunately, he passed away on June 10th, 1983, uh, when Issa was 15. Um, he spends 14 Junes and a third with his father. Thank you so much, Rasa. And so now uh, we'll hear 14 and a third Junes by Mr. Isa Bulos. Thank you.
Such a beautiful, heartfelt, poignant tribute from Isa to his father. I think it's almost appropriate if you listen carefully enough, you can hear the rain on the evening when Isa was performing that. Um, such an evocative, um, beautiful uh, piece of remembrance and tribute. Uh, so Isa, if you're watching, thank you for sharing your beautiful music with us. And now, uh, we'd like to return uh, and hear the second and third movements of uh, Tufet Sukar's uh, early string quartet. Uh, again, thanks, Nena, Tufet's wife, Nena.
Wonderful music, the last two movements of the string quartet of Tufek Sukar, the early string quartet of Tufek Sukar. Uh, again, thanks to Nena for providing that music. I did want to mention uh, Tufek studied music composition in a Western musical style in Paris, also with Olivier Messiaen, just like Dia Sukari, whose music we heard er earlier, both of them students of the French composer Olivier Messiaen. And I, I really feel like you hear those sort of dual influences, the uh, the French influence, as well as the all those sort of um, Arab world or Levantine tunes that come together uh, in that music beautifully. I wanted to mention also uh, our performers, beautiful job there, Rasa, thank you, on first violin. Um, and joining him on violin is our uh, other violinist, Jen Lecky, uh, and uh, viola, uh, Seth Van Emden, thank you, Seth, beautiful playing. Uh, I was on cello. Um, holding up the rear <laughs> um, Tom Clues. Um, and uh, speaking of uh, sort of different influences um, in music uh, and, and original compositions, um, we were so uh, honored to be able to give um, the world premiere of uh, this new piece by our special uh, guest um, composer and at the musicologist, concert presenter, pianist, educator, <laughs> he does it all. Uh, and he wrote this beautiful uh, piece for us that uh, I can't wait to share with you, uh, Torek. Thank you for being with us and thank you for the beautiful music that you let us uh, entrusted to us to, to share. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm very pleased to be here. Would you like to tell us a bit about this piece and uh, why you wrote it and, and who you wrote it for? Well, um, basically, this piece was actually commissioned by your uh, Crossing Borders music. Um, uh, when uh, Tom, you approached me uh, a few months back, and uh, you mentioned that uh, you would like to play something for String Quartet by me. And at the time, I have uh, been, you know, thinking of the idea of writing a string, string quartet for quite a while. And it, it was initiated, actually, through the wonderful work of the uh, Etihad String Quartet in this country, which was um, uh, instrumentally uh, created through the hard work of uh, Fadi Hattar, a cellist, a Jordanian cellist. Um, and he is a wonderful musician. And he has always um, asked me for a string quartet for the longest time ever. Um, after, uh, so when you, when you contacted me, I, I just decided why not just this is the opportunity to that you know to write something small, and uh, I wrote Journey One. Um, and thank you very much for enjoying it and playing it because uh, it was um, a labor of love. Really, I, I quite enjoyed writing it. Well, we enjoyed playing it very much, uh, and can't wait to share it. Um, you had mentioned Tarek that. Uh, you, you named it because it is a, a journey. I sense that too, in the sense that there's, we start off in the music in a certain place, uh, and then we go off into different adventures. We go off into those kind of creepy waltz <laughs> um, <laughs> in the middle. Uh, it sounds very, very sinister and spooky. Um, and we have different, we have these, these um, uh, very intense chords in the middle with everybody in the quartet just holding on to these intense loud chords for a long time uh, and then eventually we go back home 
but we're we're a little bit changed after the the journey. Uh, uh, what what do you think? How that, that's think my that's, interpretation I, as a performer. In fact, that's a fantastic interpretation. Um, I wouldn't have put it any better. Uh, the, uh, uh, the the idea that people in music do go on a journey, and uh, if they uh, and it's a it's a story, and if you go from one end to the other, you'll end up with. Uh, uh, with uh, an experience that either changes you or gives you a different perspective on uh, on on anything really, and uh, that's why this piece is perhaps a little schizophrenic <laughs> in certain parts because I, I I actually enjoy the melange of different different things all together, different styles, different um, uh, rhythms, different. Um, uh, I try my best. I'm, I'm not trying my best. I, I tend to do that uh, because I enjoy doing that, and I love the um, uh, the amalgamation of all of them, and then finally coming up with a, a final chapter, let's say, that brings you home. And you put it beautifully. Um, so, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Torek. And uh, I did want to share with everybody watching and listening. Torek uh, called this piece "Journey One." And uh, um, he invited us for our input uh, as far as the title, because he's not convinced that that title is quite the right title for this piece. Yep. Now, like you, Tarek, we're, we're a bunch of musicians. We are not poets. We're not great with words. And so that's why we want to hear, and Tarek would like to hear from you, listeners, Please. Yeah, about your ideas about this piece and especially what you might title it because that title, every the music is all set, but that title might change. Is that is that yeah, right? yeah definitely. I mean, the idea is it's, it's such a wonderful opportunity to be able to broadcast to so many people and get so many people's uh, input. Um, um, this, I, as I said before the show to to you all, I tend to write music and then with the title being an afterthought. And uh, I, I just, I'm constantly confused. So I end up with these generic names with one, two, three, four after them. Um, uh, so I would very much like to hear what people can, you know, what it evokes in people. And uh, it helps me to, and to come up with some sort of a title that maybe is a little bit better than Journey One, a little bit more creative than that. So yeah, please, so world, Anyone. <laughs> Beautiful. So uh, we're in an invitation to be part of our creative process. And without further ado, uh, please enjoy, for now titled Journey One, Dream Quartet.
think those are the longest two notes I've ever played in my life. Torek, I gotta ask you how you were inspired <laughs> for that ending. I think um, I, it must have been Goretzky. I was very heavily influenced by Goretzky, especially Symphony Number no. Three and uh, the ending of the big fugue at the beginning, the big canon. And um, I was very, uh, and I loved these endings. The and there was also um, uh, another um, Russian composer. The name escapes me right now, but a, a 20th century Russian composer that also wrote a piano concerto that ended also with this kind of drone in the end and i i've always loved it i think i've used it several times a very dramatic gesture. Yeah. thank <laughs> you so much <laughs> thank you so much for that Tori. congratulations it was an honor to uh, be entrusted to share that uh, music with you very much for enjoying it um our next piece um is the first movement of a string quartet by mohammed fairuz uh, an american composer uh the string quartet is called the Named Angels, and it's called that because it's about the angels that are shared in the Abrahamic traditions, the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic uh, traditions. There are certain angels that are common to all of those traditions, and each movement of the string quartet is named after one of them, this one named after Mikael or Michael. Um, Fairuz writes that Mikael or Michael, quote, brings thunder to earth, but is also identified in the Quran as an angel of mercy. And in the book of Revelation, he leads God's armies against Satan's forces. The movement captures that dichotomy as it vacillates between thunderous gestures and what I've marked as hymn of mercy in the score. So that's what Fairuz, uh, Muhammad Fairuz had to say about uh, his piece. Uh, Rasa, my understanding is that uh, growing up in Iran, that you were sort of familiar with stories about angels. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, growing up, uh, uh, the, the stories of, um, you know, uh, religious stories of uh, the prophets, uh, which uh, there are many, uh, apparently there are 124,000 prophets, and uh, most of them have some uh, interesting stories, and uh, of course, the angels, uh, these are the folkloric um, stories that are shared in the region. So, um, again, as you mentioned, uh, these are shared in the uh, between the faiths um, and, you know, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. And uh, this uh, kind of uh, growing up, I remember I was reading these stories as a child, uh, whether it was in school or as a available books that at that time was available to us. And I would imagine these stories, kind of uh, uh, vis visualizing these. And so I always had a certain image for uh, Israfil, uh, or uh, who is uh, uh, came to Prophet Muhammad and asked him to era or to read, um, or about Israel, which who is the uh, angel of death. And so uh, I, I know some other friends that uh, later we, we, we spoke about it, that uh, how we visualize these stories and how it affected us personally. Uh, in this uh, four movements, uh, we are just performing the first movement, but it's really interesting that um, in my research, uh, Muhammad is uh, referring to these four uh, pieces and this piece in general as his reflection to the uh, what is happening in Middle East at these uh, you know, it, it was composed a couple years ago, but uh, as we know, the problems or um, uh, issues in the Middle East is they're not the new <laughs> things. Uh, they're, they've been going on for many, many years. So, uh, yeah, this is, uh, we all grew up with this. I think Muhammad Fairuz grew up uh, with these folklore uh, stories, and um, it, this was his reflection on them and also the reflection on the kind of the political issues of the region. Thank you so much, Rasa, for sharing. Uh, and thank you for uh, a couple a couple of those uh, suggested titles, The Endearing Swindler and Como Rebi. Uh, thank you for your ideas. Keep them coming about uh, titles for that last piece and what you heard in that music. Uh, and now, uh, Rasa, I really liked what you said about um, 
painting a picture, having a picture in your mind. And I think that um, uh, Mohammed Fegers does such a beautiful job uh, in this piece of, of painting uh, a scene. So I uh, hope you enjoy this very intense music and yet also sometimes uh, that hymn of mercy, the, the very uh, um, um, inward looking uh, or, or merciful melody as well as the, um, the uh, thunderous themes. Please enjoy this beautiful piece. Thank you. 
That was the very dramatic fugue section of that video. We must have had a technical error that caused that mm -hmm. um, streaming to stop in the middle. Um, hopefully we can hear the rest of that uh, really exciting music and right in the middle um, of that, uh, um, right in the middle of that piece. So um, exciting and apologies for the, the technical um, issue. Let's, let's hear this, um, this movement one more time. Um, thank you.
such an exciting, exciting uh, conclusion. Wow. Wow. Nice job, Rasa. <laughs> Great playing. <laughs> Thank you, Tarek. Um, well, we have two pieces left, which we'll hear uh, without pause in between them. Uh, these are compositions by uh, Mr. Isa Bulos, who's a Palestinian and American, uh, well, he does many things uh, like Torek, an educator, uh, a composer, a performer, a uh, uh, Udist um, uh, musicologist, uh, ethnomusicologist, and we were so um, grateful uh, to him for uh, sharing with us um, his music, um, his uh, expertise, his, his insights uh, on the music, and, uh, and for inviting us to, to perform with him in arrangements that he made just for this um, opportunity. Um, Ressa, would you like to tell us about the two pieces that we'll hear? Absolutely. So um, the first piece is called Samai Nahavan. And usually um, uh, this title, uh, when uh, there is a title of Sam Samai is a, a poetic form uh, borrowed from Ottoman, uh, Turkish Ottoman, and uh, uh, still the uh, Arab Arabic um, uh, regions, the composers are coming up with new Samais uh, in different uh, maghams, uh, which are the modes. Um, and uh, this title, uh, kind of the first part, Samai, refers to uh, the form of the song, which again is a poetic form. And the second part, Nahavant, is a, the, refers to the maram, the mode of the uh, song. Um, usually there is a third part, uh, it's the name of the composer, whoever wrote that Samai, and uh, showed. So this is supposed to be Samai Nahavan Bulus, or uh, to have a full title in a traditional way. Uh, yeah, it uh, has a very exciting rhythm. Uh, it's a, a kind of, uh, usually in Western style, we have either music in four or three. We say one, two, three, four. But this one uh, is a little bit more com uh, complex than that. It's a one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. It, that uh, creates a very um, exciting groove. The second piece uh, is called Raqs al Junub or Raq Dance of the South. And Isa writes that. Uh, the piece is about how we react to situations that are unfamiliar, unfamiliar or uncomfortable to us. Uh, the piece relies on the tension between our inner struggles and how we often tend to uh, distinguish that this disguise such tensions through a different presentation of ourselves on the outside. Thank you so much, Rasa. Um, uh, and thank you for explaining a bit about the maqam. Um, there's a sound that I can't quite make <laughs> in my th throat to pronounce that, but if you want to Google it, M-A-Q-A-M, and it's the, the series of modes or the, the, the uh, groups of notes um, that you'll hear in a certain uh, piece of music often going from one group of notes that's used in a certain way to a, a different set of a group of notes that are used in a certain way and then maybe on to a third and so we sort of tell a story um, and uh, in, in, uh, at some moments uh, you'll hear uh, Isam and Rasa uh, using maqam that have uh, a series of notes, again, that you can't really find on a piano. If, if uh, Ressa was playing piano, he wouldn't be able to play along with Isa. Fortunately, he plays the violin and he can put his fingers wherever he wants on that string and make whatever <laughs> kinds of pitches he can, um, whatever kinds of pitches he want, wants to. And uh, so you'll hear some beautiful, beautiful music by Mr. Isa Bulos. Before we go, um, I wanted to thank uh, our guests, Rasa and Tarek, this has been such an interesting and enlightening conversation. Thank you so much uh, from the bottom of my heart to both of you and uh, to all of the performers, um, including our, our guest, Mr. Isa Bulos, who you're about to hear again, um, and all of the other composers. Um, we're so uh, appreciative uh, to be able to share your music uh, on this platform. I wanted to thank behind the scenes, um, uh, Tavari Kruch, um, Oh, yes, thank you. There's uh, Isa Bulo's website, and uh, in a moment we'll see Rasa's and Torat's. Um, so please check um, these wonderful, there's Rasa's, rasamahmudian.com. Uh, 
Um, please check out uh, their websites, learn more about them, uh, learn more about their music. Um, also behind the scenes, there's Torek's website. Uh, also behind the scenes, uh, Ms. Savi Chorm, who is a, a board member of Crossing Borders Music. We're so glad to have her helping out also behind the scenes. We want to thank also all of our other uh, board members from Crossing Borders Music. Um, thank you to our board who make these sorts of events possible. You can learn more about us at crossingbordersmusic.org. There's the website on uh, the screen. Our mission as a nonprofit organization is to use music to promote the dignity of people from all cultures. Uh, so many people to thank. Uh, so uh, just one more moment. We have the Paul M. Angel Family Foundation who have been very generous uh, sponsors to all of our programs uh, for, for years now. Um, and uh, we really appreciate them sort of underwriting this concert series as well as uh, Second Unitarian Church who provided the beautiful space in the videos that you see as well as rehearsal space. The Department of uh, Cultural Affairs and Special Events of the City of Chicago, uh, and also the Illinois Arts Council Agency. Whew. So thank you. Um, oh, plus <laughs> all of you, we want to thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. And now finally, without further ado, our last two pieces. This is the very first time uh, that uh, Almost anybody has heard these brand new arrangements by uh, Mr. Isa Bulo. So please enjoy these two beautiful uh, uh, pieces, uh, dances by Mr. Isa Bulo. Thank you.
Right, beautiful, and uh, our next piece. Mm -hmm. 